Brianna was great, wasn't she? Thank you. That, I love hearing about design thinking. That's um, so on trend and really something that we're all getting involved in in our, uh, in our businesses. And thank you for Tricia and Marcus for handing out our handouts for this session. Um, so you can, well, I'll, I'll explain those in just a minute. <clears throat> so this session is called the GPS for driving insights that get action. And what I'm hoping this will do is tie the loop, a nice little knot loop around the topics that were discussed over the last day and a half. I'm Carol Shea. I am uh, the uh, lead consultant for Olive Tree Insights. I started in high school wanting to be a biologist until I found out in college that you could actually study people. So I said, forget animals, forget plants, forget fish. I want to study people and have had a very long career in, um, in doing just that multiple different, um, multiple different venues. So today, what the takeaways will be um, are three. And the first thing we'll talk about very shortly is the destination. So if we've got a GPS system for actionable insights, where are we actually going and why we want to get there? Second, what are the roadblocks and the um, pitfalls and issues? And then third, we'll spend the most time on this GPS for driving insights, which actually also has three elements. So what you have in front of you um, now is going to be a stack that's called the Smart Insight Brief. One person gets each of those. One person also gets the model that we'll talk about at the very end. And then there's a group activity. We'll get through the first group activity um, as in tables. And then the second group activity uh, we'll get through um, in ma on mass. I also, uh, while I'm in this presentation spotlight quite a lot because I'm an adjunct faculty, I really don't like to talk. <laughs> so I really prefer to listen. So I will be asking questions of you throughout this presentation. And I hope you'll entertain me and help take some of the burden away from me a little bit. Okay. So the destination. So we're in a situation now that's probably really very exciting from a business standpoint. We've got big thinkers like Brianna that are bringing design thinking to us as businesses. Um, as yesterday, Anheuser-Busch talked about, we're moving from 18-month new business cycles to, to th two-month new business cycles. Um, lean startup philosophies have now been embraced by big businesses. So we've got um, agile movement and, and et cetera. And then on top of that, we've got technology and all the big data um, that has come into organizations. So we're being charged to move faster than ever. I can tell you that personally, when I first started in marketing research, it was not unusual for a typical project to be three to four months in length. And now it's three to four days in length. So a lot has to happen for, for that to occur and for, to, for us to be effective in that kind of an environment. The other thing that's happening that's probably why I call this the golden era of marketing research is that finally the C-suite has seen the light. No longer do they think it's okay to be operationally and financially driven. They now are at least talking the talk, if not walking the walk, of customer-based decisions and being informed on their consumer. And so at the C level, we have their attention. But as a researcher, and especially a researcher with a lot of years behind me, you start to look around and say, what's changing? How is it changing? And one of the big ahas I had is that while we are in this, this incredible position of power in our organizations, or we should be, some organizations um, are doing better than others. And each of the six that you see here, each have a marketing research department. So what is Sears doing different than Walmart? You know, what is CVS doing different than Campbell? How are they maximizing their research department and their insights to become more successful and build sustainable businesses? So the, it became like an obsession with me. <laughs> like, what is this? And I uh, 
got together with a group of a lot of my friends that are also in marketing research. Most of them are in uh, corporate insights functions. I also met with probably 20 or 30 uh, leads, brand managers, and heads of marketing departments because I wanted to hear from their viewpoint what the situation was. So I'm going to spend just a couple minutes on um, some roadblocks and um, pitfalls that I see and that this collective team came up with as kind of a conclusion. But I want to start first with, as I was exploring the problem, three quotes that I heard from researchers, and I want to see if these sound familiar to you. Why didn't you ask any questions about the new competitive product launch? This study can't have included the right people. Yep. Hey, we've got a new $20 million campaign running soon. Can you help me justify it? That's always my favorite. <laughs> um, so a couple of years ago, um, Quirks ran a, well, they run an annual corporate researcher report uh, and analysis. And a couple of years ago, they studied the issue about insights not being acted on. And they asked researchers, how often is this a challenge in your organization? And for most companies, it is at least sometimes a challenge. And you can see for almost half, it's often or always a challenge to get insights acted on. So from your perspective, from my perspective, basically the fuel isn't making it to the engine. Why? So here's where I need a little bit of help. So you are all been in this same boat. What are some thoughts you have on why action isn't being taken? There's a difference between business need and political need. Oh, that's that $20 million I've already spent. <laughs> Justify. Yes, that's political. Political um, needs are there. What else? The teams don't want to put in the work at the beginning of the project to actually get the objectives and everything. They just want it done. Yeah, they, they move fast. They just want to move fast, and they don't know why you're holding it up. It's the point that Warren made a moment ago. How do you get them to be engaged? Well, it also gives up a little bit of power in that they have to listen to the consumers and the, the, the truth as opposed to just doing what I want to do. Oh, my gosh, yes, that's that's so true. And, so, and related to the political piece, it's about all about me, not really about the consumer. There are a number of these causes. I'm going to cover four that I see as that, well, I collective, the collective I, <laughs> the group has saw as really being big issues in driving this disconnect between action and uh, between insights and action. And the first one, who's in the car? So do you really have the leader voice as you're setting the objectives? Do you more likely have someone the leader has designated as the research person, you know, the, the brand person that's going to connect with the research team um, to express what the needs are? When you don't have the right people in the car, and not just the, the, the business owner, problem owner, but also all the peripheral business leaders, if you're doing something in new product development, you had better include operations, R&D in those upfront conversations, because I'm going to guarantee they'll unearth um, issues that would come up at the end if you didn't address it at the beginning. Second, roadblocks and potholes. What I really liked about, about some of the things that Brianna talked about is thinking about the big picture. As a researcher, I'll say I, I own this issue. I have a project mindset. Somebody comes to a, an issue with me, to me, and I say, oh, let's, let me see how I can solve that problem. That is a project <coughs> mindset as opposed to thinking, where am I really going and how do I avoid all those little roadblocks, places to get stuck? Iterative learning is the key here. Third, it's hitting the accelerator too quickly. I just want three focus groups. Get me three focus groups tomorrow. And it'll, you know, we'll figure it out as we go. So obviously not thinking about what the objectives are and the like. And the third really points to some of the political or I have these hypotheses I want you to prove out kind of elements. So if you get at the end of the study, you know, your, your brand manager knows that everyone is going to love the new website launch and you launch the website and they, you, you do a quick test and they don't like it, 
well, let's face it, the consumers are wrong. <laughs> so it's that, how do you get that from, that from happening at the end, of the end of the day? Okay. So I set out those to be two quick sections, so because we're going to spend really the most amount of time in what the team and I worked on in terms of, so how do you actually solve this issue? I have been trained as a researcher. I have a master's degree in research myself, and um, I have worked with some of the best minds in research in terms of problem solving and creating good methodologies, but there's still something obviously missing even after so many years of doing research. So what are the, what's a path forward for us? There are three elements to the path. The first is aligning on the right problem, which is, again, why I love design thinking in principle, even more so than agile and lean, which bring us the agile and lean bring us a lot of uh, this, the whole idea of iterative learning. But what I love about, about design thinking is it really forces you to think about solving the right problem. Second, aligning on the right resources. I don't know about you. But oftentimes, I'm given the resource without really thinking about what it is I'm supposed to be doing with it. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. And then third, aligning on action, which is that end deliverable and um, where we need to be. OK. So align on the problem. This probably looks familiar. Somebody, a brand manager, comes up to you and says, hey, can we do some groups? We need to identify why sales are stagnant. And you see the response. In what ways are they stagnant? So talk to me. I think one of the things I have learned through this process is that every researcher I've ever met knows how to do this intuitively. It's kind of like how we're, how we're wired. What are some of your favorite uh, probing techniques when you're, ch when you're asked a question like this by your business partners? Favorite, favorite probes? for business partners. Yep. We try to figure out what degrees of freedom we have to move. So what would you do differently? Or like, what can you do differently sometimes? Well, yes, what, what, do, what are you going to do differently? Or what can you do differently? And so talk about the degrees of freedom. Just one more, one okay. more minute there. <laughs> Sorry. Um, that usually helps me frame up because sometimes there could be an answer, but we don't have the resource to actually execute that. So trying to figure out where we actually can move. What are the restrictions and non-negotiables <laughs> or what is perfect. available? That's perfect. Okay, I love that question. That would be very successful. Yes. So I'm a big fan of putting people's words back in front of them and then saying, well, tell me more about that. <laughs> so <laughs> in this minute, I would say, well, you say your sales are stagnant. So tell me more about that. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> That's the true researcher response. Yep. OK, good. One more? Just one more? OK. That's, uh, you know, one, like I say, I think that over time, I've learned research teams have their favorite pep questions in terms of how to probe business stakeholders. And a couple, maybe three years ago now, I had the opportunity to read the book, The Checklist Manifesto. And it sort of was one of those like ideas to me. Um, checklist, this book is about uh, a physician who had noticed difficulties in, in surgical suites around hospital infections. And surgical suites are a place where there's very highly expert people. Everyone in a surgical suite, um, Nurses, doctors, aides, and anesthetists. I can't say that word. You know what I mean. Um, yes, that's the. the, the, the. <laughs> um, you know, they're very highly skilled people. They are experts. Yet still, in, sur in surgeries, there's this incredible uh, difficulty with hospital infections. And Dr. Gawande studied um, pilots and I can't remember the other industry, but how come there. <coughs> There's, we have very little error in airlines, in airplanes. And one of the things he noted is that pilots have a checklist. They must go through that checklist every time. So he brought the idea to, this, to John Hopkins, and to which the surgeon said, no flipping away. We are not using a checklist. That's the stupidest idea I've ever heard. And he finally convinced one small group to do a test. 
First, let's first let's diagnose before I tell you what happened after. Why would surgeons re reject the idea of a checklist? Ego. Ego. Yes, I'm the expert. Why would you have me possibly do a checklist that is that's so beneath me? But what he found was when they implemented the checklist is that surgeons had this epiphany that sometimes they skip steps in the heat of the moment. You know, we know what we should do, but there's also that I've only got three minutes, I've got to prioritize, something gets skipped. When they implemented the checklist, hospital infection rates went down 20%. And that triggered massive changes in, surg in surgical suites around the country. So I thought, how can that idea impact us? So we worked with the um, worked with about 20 corporate insights teams on best practices around the insights brief. And what you have in front of you, this smart insights brief, has the way we structured the key questions and as our checklist. And we needed to, we identified these as being um, places where we needed to make sure we hit and we had good answers to before a before a project would move forward. forward. Are there anything, ra just raise your hand, I won't ask you to speak, but is there anything on this list that seems unusual to you? Anything that seems out of bounds? Right, so no hands being raised. Like I say, like that surgical suites list, there's nothing here that's brain surgery, it's the process of doing it. <coughs> I will point out a few that we as a team noted were understood as being important, but, all, but very often missed. The first one is hypotheses and expectations. So with, when you miss somebody's hypothesis, like I know this, this website's gonna be awesome, that's when you get stuck at the end. Um, another one is the research and analytics decision criteria. If I have in my head that uh, as a researcher, I'm thinking this process through, top two box is good enough, does my decision, is that good enough for my decision maker too? So having some of those conversations on the, the, not just the techniques you're going to use, but what's the decision criteria for a win or loss can be really, really impactful. Now, I think it's, um, oh, one more thing on this. So again, moving away from a project mentality is really critical. And I do want to communicate very strongly that having a brief should exist for the business objective, not for every little element within that business objective. So you may have one broad objective, you have a linear process of three, four, five different decisions, and then underneath those are, object are research objectives and methodologies. That's the framework for the brief. If we had that kind of framework on a more consistent basis, you know, my, my um, point would be we'd spend less time on the brief in each one of these little areas every time you go through it. It's really more of a conversation up front and then iterative learning as you go. To make this more concrete, oh, uh, to make this more concrete in terms of being very clear about objectives. Yeah, go ahead. Do you mind for a quick question? Um, yeah. So with um, the hypotheses, yeah. especially on more exploratory research, how do you handle, you know, we have all these ideas of what we're going to find and have, oh, you're fine. Um, so we have all these ideas of what are we going to find, what we expect to find, and then a large majority <coughs> of that doesn't end up showing up in the research. How do you yeah. handle communicating that? Actually, if you know that up front, what um, the best practice on that is during the study, you actually look at early stage field results. You identify those as being, because you know those are hot button issues, you identify those as being um, off track. You alert the decision maker that, look, we're midway through. This is what it's looking, looking, at, looking like. Um, is there anything in this process that would make you that would help you believe these results. So sometimes, for example, we've actually boosted sample size. So it's like, oh, you're kidding. Are you sure you have a big enough sample? Let's make sure we're gonna add 300 more people. So, you know, that, if you do it midway and you already know it, you've kind of, you've kind of shorted out that conversation at the end. And it does become a little bit easier, actually, as we go through this process. In terms of clarifying objectives, what I'd like us to do is uh, one of the, uh, one group activity, it's group activity one at each table. Because um, 
what I want to have us uh, focus on is how varied these, these objectives can really be. So if you look at this particular case, this is a uh, business that, it's, it's a soda pop business. They are looking at gaining new customers with a new package design. So somehow, business leadership has decided we're, we need to have a, a, a new package redesign. It's a refresh. Um, the uh, research and business management team, new product team, have come up with three stages of the decision. The first part of the decision would be, let's make sure that we are actually working on the right, uh, the right area. So what it would be, could be the impact um, of new packaging on gaining new customers. The research team comes up with, okay, let's really prioritize what are all the barriers to new customers, make sure that the new packaging would actually be in that lineup. Once you validate that, you move on to what are our, our, our new packaging options. The research piece are, is what our category users needs with regard to package, uh, and then the third, once you pass that, is actually selecting the uh, new best new packaging, and then which new package design is best. From a structural standpoint, does this seem clear to you generally? This show of hands, clear? Pretty clear, okay. Um, I'd like us to do an exercise that I hope you can repeat with your business leaders. So we're going to take a look at the research objective to the right, which new package design is best. There's a technique from De Bono called uh, scope parameters. And you kind of, it basically is pushing at an objective statement in a few different significant ways and then coming up with a revised statement that's much more specific, measurable, objective, and thorough. So as a table, what I'd like you to do is brainstorm multiple ways of st stating this research objective and write one more clear way. I'll ask a couple groups to state their objective, and then we're going to talk about the implications of that. Some of the ways to vary the statements, replace some or all the descriptors. Like, instead of best, what else could you say? Um, you could add more modifiers. You could clarify what criteria you'll use to define the best or what's, not, what's out of scope, basically, what's not part of the objective. So you'll just have a few minutes for this. You guys are smart. Let's go ahead and put together an objective statement that's much more. And if you're at a single person, if you want to do it yourself, that's fine. Or if you want to move to a table, that's fine, too. Um, meanwhile, knowing this is shortly before lunch, I do have a little bit of a treat for everybody. So if Marcus and Trisha could help me help me hand out um, a little bit of a sugar snack here. <laughs> Let's, uh, also in the meantime, if you are, um, you know, ready to eat, go there, grab some food, bring it in. We can start our working lunch. So we're, the transition time is not too long to the next session. Okay, let's see. So we have to take these like veterans of that and Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay. All right. So let's hear from, let's hear a couple of different objectives. If So can this table share? Would you share your objective? Why not, right? You're the bomb. Thank you. So the first thing we were going to do is just define what is best. So understand um, if the goal was awareness or trial or repeat and what it's driving. So the new objective is which new packaging is going to drive the most awareness. Oh, okay. Uh, which new packaging is going to drive the most awareness? I love that because you now have an action item. Does that now from what you just said and what that says, does that help you guide methodology? Yes. Right? Okay, who else has who else is a brave soul here? Come on back here, you guys. I saw you working hard. Awesome. So uh we came up with uh design is best. Best doesn't doesn't give us anything. So we're trying to look at like memorable. Is it uh, appealing to? Is it like resonate with their values of your target customer? And so in specifically, we're like, okay, well, are we looking at like health conscious millennials or um, environmentally conscious individuals too? So I think there's a lot more questions to ask, like who are the new customers and what are we trying to uh, get from that? this campaign. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, lo I love all the thinking and the options that you came up with because it's not one or you need to really understand from your perspective, what are your business users, users going to own? What actually will help them select the right business, um, the right business ob objective? Uh, similar to that, I would also say it's important to remove the word new from the question just because, um, just because you have new packaging designs doesn't necessarily mean that that is the most consumer friendly or it, it's just it's not a consumer oriented business question so that's fantastic i hadn't actually thought about removing the word new suppose you do a test and one and your current package does better than the new options well crap <laughs> you know then what do you do then where then where are you okay so too many things in my hand this is actually this is actually from a real case and it evolved into 
Does one new package score significantly better than current at building interest among non-customers <coughs> without alienating current customers? It's kind of revealing some of that un underlying issues. And the standards for best ability to hold attention, purchase intent, significance, how they're measured. Um, again, when you think about methodologies that might have been used earlier versus what's here, you see not only you can't do a concept here, you have to do a shelf set test. You know, it starts to guide you on what makes sense and what's going to be believed. What's further that's not here is actually there was a further statement that said, if a, pr a new package does not meet any of these criteria, we will stay with the existing package. Okay, the, the last issue I want to talk about here in aligning to problems, make sure you cover a symptom and cover a problem and not a symptom. Um, we had a case where we were working with a bank. They wanted to uh, do an advertise, a test on different um, print ads to build their checking account base of new customers. New checking account, print ad. So we started really diagnosing what the issue was, and we, we requested, can we look at some of your current data, current customer data, some trends, before we, before we actually put together the methodology for um, testing concepts, which, which hadn't really, to be honest, they hadn't been developed. They were still in process of being developed. And thankfully, we did that because we found out that um, the mortgages, new mortgages were declining for this bank, and new mortgages were the key driver for new checking accounts. So we actually, again, that's from silos in companies. The mortgage people weren't talking to the checking people. So they didn't recognize that there was this crossover. So we would have wound up working on trying to solve a, the, a symptom versus thinking, what is happening with our mortgage business? So the, the SMART brief um, has four real key benefits. Um, they're written on here. Basically, you've got a process built in that gives you permission to ask the hard questions. Warren asked a little bit earlier, and it's probably the biggest bane for me as a researcher, is when a, a, um, a leader doesn't really want to engage. They just want you to do the work. And so I'll tell you how our teams, we implemented this smart brief process in about half a dozen companies using a software platform. And what we did, we learned very quickly, um, just telling brand people they needed to spend more time up front wasn't good enough. So we identified, each of the research teams identified one brand person or marketing person that they knew was an ally in this thinking, that we're kind of already engaging with pretty deeply, and they asked them to be a role model for the process. Um, they gave them all the rationale on what this process, how this process was gonna help them. They said, can we set you up as a case study for the company? And they did. And what happened in every single situation was that the outcome of the research, the process of the research and the outcome was so much stronger that that brand or marketing manager became an advocate for the process. Um, and that's how those, the process got implemented throughout those organizations. The second piece is aligning on the right resources. So we're down here now. We've got know what we do. What are we doing with methodology? So... Actually, let me go back to this for a second. How, are, how do you do methodology today? Like, just really quickly, um, how do you design methodology today? Is it a team activity? Is it individual activity? Maybe raise your hand if it's a team activity on designing methodology. Yes, yes. <laughs> for most people, I think, for at least especially on the supplier side, maybe not client, it's a team activity. So um, in this activity, I'm, instead of doing it as an activity, I want us to just think about this for a minute, and then maybe it, you can offer some suggestions. Let's take that package design question, and just want to hear from you, which new package design is best? What might be a methodology that you might use to address this problem? Does anyone have a, have a methodology? You could just yell it out. Yeah. Uh, shelf set testing? Shelf set testing. What other methodology, what other technique might you pull out of your, um, your toolkit? Monadic quant. Um, a monadic quant, absolutely. 
Yes? A, a conjoint with... A conjoint, right? One of the really big um, ahas we had in this process is that methodology, uh, even when you're in a team, it's biased by your experiences as a researcher. If you have a lot of conjoint research experience, you're going to know that when to, you're going to think, oh, that might be a methodology I could use, or shelf test test experience. Um, let's see if I put something here. Yeah. So it's this idea that when we are looking at methodologies, we need to be we need to be really ingrained in our in our field. This is probably the most important case for your employers to send you to conferences. This is where you learn about new methodologies and new ways of approaching things and taking a one or two day retreat to meet with new vendors, answer those phone calls, don't delete those, don't delete those emails when you see a new technology or a new, a new approach to something. It's our responsibility to learn this so that methodologies, uh, methodologies are not flat, we're not using always the same thing, and we're really considering the best solution. The other one is aligning on the right resources. So I don't know about you, but my experience on aligning on the right resources, which means time and money, is that somebody gives me a budget, and they say, you have three weeks or six weeks or whatever, and that's how we align on resources. Does that sound familiar? OK. So as we were experimenting with the new Smart Insights Brief, we also realized, hey, there might be a better way at looking at standardizing decision criteria. So we came up with this document. If you can pull this up, it's called the Market Research Investment Decisions Model Scoring. You'll see that there's, for every major business, this is not a project issue, this is a major initiative. This is a, a, for something that's a bigger, bigger picture piece. How much should you spend and how much resources? You'd actually go through and score how close does it fit with strategic initiatives? Will it drive decisions? Are you in the ID, are you in the uh, problem opportunity stage? Are you in a tactical stage? Mes uh, methodology feasibility, et cetera. And then there's a resource allocation at the bottom, high impact, high actionability, high feasibility, high allocation. Low impact, low actionability, low feasibility, low allocation. Makes sense, right? Every research team love this approach. Just guess what you think the business leaders thought of it. They hated it. <laughs> it was a total disaster. <laughs> they, but I will say, I wouldn't say total disaster. What it alerted them to was, an, it actually wound up being an educational piece. They did not want to go through that scoring process, so that kind of got killed. But what it, they do still use it as a philosophical. So they think about these issues more in a philosophical way, and it fosters the conversation of are we putting the right resources around it. It's really more of a, it wound up being really more of an educational tool. Though I haven't given up on it, and if anybody has um, like the, you know, this uh, desire to test something, like let me know and I'm, I'm all in with you. Okay. So, align on action. And really the biggest way to align on action is first to start with the brief. And even if it's not signed, act like it's a signed contract and continue to reinforce that this is what we're doing, this is why we're doing it, and this is what we expect the outcome is, and this is what we expect, how are you going to use it? Ongoing engagement, we talked a moment ago about the fact that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, when you had an issue where you start to see things go south from the client perspective, how you need to engage with them throughout the process from the beginning all, all the way through the middle and the end. And then third, measure results. Are you actually, in the brief, there's a place to actually put, we are going to follow up with you in six months, 12 months, to see how this initiative turned out. Who does that here regularly? One, two, three. Okay, it should be all of us, right? We should have it on our calendar that six months, 12 months, two years, we are following up to see what the results are. The, the last final point I wanna make in terms of, of wrapping this all up is in the insights brief, hold time six weeks out, eight weeks out, whatever the time is, to hold an activation workshop. This is a process where the research team leads a workshop 
that starts with a very short presentation of the report, because you would have already uh, handed those out in advance. And there'd be a thorough work session that goes through um, some big group session, mini group session, and that what comes out of that are action steps and promises made by business leaders. There's no faster way to set yourself up as a strategic researcher than to implement this process based on the brief. So we've talked about you know, where we know we need to go and where we are, what we get, where we get stuck, a GPS for driving insights. We know that this is historically where we've been, insights not being acted on with these new processes and tools. We hope we get here where it's never a challenge. Thank you very much for your attention.